And now, stay tuned for part two of the Either And podcast with our special CRT episode with Tristan Bruins. So, what I have next prepared for you is not a produced video uh-huh. that is made for mass consumption. So uh-huh. This is a public video on YouTube. I assume if he didn't like it, that he'd have it he taken down. It down. I don't know why he doesn't, because I think it's uh, it kind of, well, you will see. But this is at the, I believe, the Claremont Institute, another like right-wing think tank. Yeah, we're going to get into the names. The conversation you and I were having last mm-hmm. week about naming stuff so it doesn't sound so offensive because they're killing me. Manhattan Institute, the Claremont Institute, the Freedom First Movement, the America First Movement. Like, really? Heritage. Something. Yeah, like y'all think y'all slick. But go ahead, go ahead. Anyway, so this is him like at a meeting. This is where he's he's very loose in this one. Uh-huh. There's no music. He's just kind of speaking. <laughs> he seems very casual. He's sitting in a chair. He looks relaxed, uh-huh. right? Or he's yeah, at like a I, desk. I know he's what slumped clip this over. Is, yeah. I mean, it's just you know, and he's he's very loose, and you'll hear that he's talking real loose. Uh huh. And he gives us like four points how to combat the critical race theory. Uh huh. And they're not the same points he said before. You'd think they'd be the same, but anyways. So we start with just a little introduction to him. He goes into detail on when he, because he mentioned that he influenced uh, the former president uh-huh. in his decision. So he kind of talks about Yeah, he that. couldn't wait to mention that. So check it out. Thought it might be helpful for me to just share uh, what I've come up with now very quickly as, as six uh, principles or techniques or tactics uh, to fighting this uh, culture war. And... Um, it's all based on my experience over the last year. Uh, stumbled into it backwards initially and then have really enjoyed fighting it. But uh, about a year ago, a little, a little less than a year ago, I started reporting on um, diversity trainings in the federal government and looking at DEI trainings, critical race theory trainings at uh, first actually one story in the, in the city of Seattle that, that took off and then I, I started getting sources reaching out to me from Treasury, Homeland Security, FBI, DHS, uh, VA, EPA, the National Credit Union Association, (laughs) or or NCOA, whatever that is. Um, And all of these stories of these uh, divisive, abusive, ideological, and extreme brainwashing programs that they were subjecting uh, federal bureaucrats to. And I started basically riding the dragon of these reports and uh, putting them out on Twitter, uh, you know, appearing on Tucker or Laura Ingram in the, the cable news. The next morning I get a call from a 202 number and I'm in Washington state. So that's like a more of a rare occurrence for me. And I just like it's seven in the morning calls my cell phone and I said, all right, this is, this is about to go down. And uh, it's Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. And he says, Christopher, the president saw you last night. He instructed me to take immediate action. Let's get something done. And, uh, and this, I think, has led to a huge moment in uh, this fight on these ideological fights in this country. And it turned critical race theory from an ab- obscure academic discipline and a series of Harvard Law Review articles from 1992 uh, into a national fight that conservatives are winning. Right, so a little bit different because, like, before he goes back to eighteen, right, right, uh, right, eighteen forty-eight, <laughs> and the Communist Manifesto. But now it's an obscure bunch of Harvard articles <laughs> from nineteen ninety, right, 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 two or whatever, right. So because well, now he's talking to his 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 bubble. Yeah, he's not trying to scare them so much. Right, right. I think it's important to fight ideologies, not people. Um. A lot of the social media and cable news and uh, general information that gets you know passed around on Facebook is fighting people. So there's all the bad people. There's Ocasio Cortez. There's the Squad. There's you know Joe Biden. There's you know whoever the bad person of the day is. And there's so much energy that get gets drawn into these personality fights. It's Candace Owens fighting on Twitter with Cardi B. Um, and this gives a sense of conflict and emotional satisfaction, but I think it's at, at best unproductive and, and probably more likely counterproductive. 
Right, so he's not going after people. Uh huh. He's going after, and yeah, and that goes to what I was saying earlier about him and all these legal suits he's been bringing, because he's the one that 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 heads up the organization that the the lawsuits against uh, uh, the colleges. He's doing the uh, mm-hmm. the race based admissions thing and saying that it's 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 uh, he it didn't work when he used white students, so he now he's using Chinese students mm. or Asian students and saying that. That uh, f- affirmative action is is unfair to Asian students. I said, "Damn, this dude." So that's his first point. He's uh-huh. fighting, he's fighting uh-huh. ideology. Um, I think with this critical race theory fight is what what we did successfully is we labeled it. People were understanding that something is going wrong in the culture that that certain uh, ideologies and ideas were devouring institutions, and then we put a label to it: critical race theory. Actually, they put a label to it in the 1990s. We just appropriated it. Uh, and then we went <laughs> at attacking it, attacking it Wait, both Paul's theoretically. Saying. Wait, somebody white just, just, just volunteered that they appropriated something. Yeah. I just want to take a moment. Yeah. I mean, what else would that mean? Just, you know, but like, yeah, we took it to mean something different. We, we wanted to mean what we didn't wanted you to mean. Say, when, when did you say the first scholars and all that stuff came up when we were talking earlier in the interview? Didn't you say the late seventies? Yeah, late seventies. Then what did he say? The nineties. Nineties. Well, okay. that's like, like I said, like it got its name in like eighty nine uh-huh, or uh-huh, ninety two. So, uh-huh. so that's when. Okay, got you it. Know. Anyways, we just appropriated it, uh, and then we went at attacking it, attacking it both theoretically, uh, attacking its principles and making those arguments, uh, but also attacking it at a very practical political level and providing political leaders with a cudgel uh, with which um, to beat down these uh, institutions. Uh, so I think that's number one. It just, it all makes sense now. And, it, and it. It, it. Yeah, yeah, and, he, and he's right. And that, that goes back to what I said earlier in the conversation about I thought, I was under the impression that people just didn't know, which is why anytime they talked about anything racially based, they called it CRT. But now to know that that was his intention, label it, include everything in it, and then again the boogeyman. You've now made the boogeyman Equity, that nobody wants. Diversity, it, yeah, inclusion, all of that is critical race theory. Handicap parking, it's all, <laughs> it's all. In the well, same it's thing. the same reason they're taking all the books out of schools in Florida right now. Mm. You know that 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 haven't been approved, and uh, it's a whole another conversation. Yeah, but here he is. Like I hear this as him admitting that. They just labeled a bunch of stuff. You know, we created, yeah. we, we labeled it. We created a brand. Yeah, absolutely. Which is not the same as like what he was saying before. Yeah. Don't win the debate, Number win the two. fight. Um, <laughs> I've seen like the most nasty and vituperative fights are when you say something, and and I, I I try to stay out of these fights because I'm ignorant, but I'm sure Michael Anton would be very knowledgeable. But you know, if you say, well, this all you know can be traced back to Hegel. Um, you get the most insane fighting uh, in this academic realm. And, uh, and, and I've noticed people trying to bait me into a lot of these fights where they say, well, you don't even understand the true historical nature of critical race theory. Or you must not have read, you know, Mari Matsuda's definitive <laughs> 1996 paper. Um, and I, I just avoid these fights and I block those people and I move on because... <laughs> You know, there's these, like, very uh, kind of pathetic and very, you know, angry graduate students uh, that, that, you know, try to fight me on these highly technical, uh, you know, Hegel interpretations. And it's like, I don't have time for this. I don't give a shit about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Hegel is the main influence of Marx. Right. And so when he's saying these graduate students are coming at me and be like, no, you don't understand what they mean. It's because he doesn't understand what it means because, first of all, Hegel is... Like, I'm not capable of reading Hegel right now. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. I know I've tried. Uh-huh. I might as well be reading Wittgenstein, so you know, it's all Greek to me. Um, but but that's the Marxism he's talking about. Where does Marx get his, his ideas from? From Hegel, uh-huh. right? But that's he, like the main but, dude. But he's so. never... Or the the paper by Matsuda, he mentions it, but he never admits whether he's read them or not. He just he says, "I don't care." Yeah, no, it was obvious to me the way he said it that well, he hasn't a, read them. For a thing, he does. He just says he doesn't give a shit about. Yeah, it's the other the video basis. starts with what? Yeah, that's and true. And keeps bringing up what Marxism. 
over and over again. But he doesn't actually give <laughs> a crud about about it, yeah, Marxism yeah. or Hegel or Paul Freire or or Bruno Bauer or any of this stuff or Das Kapital. He doesn't care about <laughs> any of this. No, but and again that the, the, so now he's show so in this in this situation he's showing what his true intentions are he's showing his hand what his real purpose is because if your whole if your whole argument rests on that this is marxism in disguise uh-huh. you'd think you would know who the hell hegel is oh i just want to <laughs> you would know who hegel is if right you right 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 but, but he would have come up is what i'm saying right but he doesn't know he doesn't talk about and doesn't then he says he doesn't give care a, Anything Right Anyway Okay that That's my least favorite clip Just cause <laughs> Poor Hegel <laughs> People will email me There are There are There are people that are You know That are making these cases against you And it says Alright well There are some academics That are ankle biting me On social media While we have State legislators Banning this ideology In their entire states Representing what 120 million Americans And you know, Ron DeSantis and Tom Cotton and Ted Cruz and everyone else who is fighting in the political arena, we are winning in these political fights. We can cede the academic fights to their irrelevant position. <laughs> wow. So I kind of hit the, the button a couple of times. Uh-huh. But he's saying that it's like people are, you know, smarty pants people are coming to us and being like, look, yeah. you don't understand this stuff. And he's like, but meanwhile, but we're winning in these. The governor of Florida <laughs> says that it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. That is a classic appeal to authority. Yeah. Right. Well, what do you mean? Heroin is bad. Janis Joplin did heroin. <laughs> She's famous. Jimi Hendrix did fa- heroin. He's famous. He's one of the most respected guitar you know, yeah. musicians of all time. How could it be bad if these great people say it's good? Yeah, or yeah. Or how could this be good if these other people say that it's bad? Right, right, right. Which has nothing to do with whether it's good or whether bad at all. Whether it's good or bad, absolutely. Right? Classic appeal to authority. Like, that's, you know, it's the stuff he says, like, on the in-betweens of the points he makes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You get to actually see how he feels. Yeah. Interesting. Fourth, uh, don't point out hypocrisy. Uh, <laughs> change power structures. Uh, there is a genre of conservative uh, uh, commentary where we think that if we point out hypocrisy for the next time that we're really going to own the libs. Um, this is like, it, it's actually, it doesn't work, A, but B, I think it's actually even worse. The hypocrisy is not, you know, the hypocrisy is really the point of all this, right? Uh, the hypocrisy doesn't reveal that these people are morally uh, hypocritical. The hypocrisy reveals that they Uh, have a position in the real world of practical power that enables them to be shamelessly and openly hypocritical and you can't do anything about it, right? The point is not to tag them with the label of hypocrite. Uh, This is politics. At a certain point, you could probably tag that label to a lot of people. The point is to change the political and, and the structures of power beneath them that enable them to be hypocritical. Does that make sense? So he wants to change the structures of power. <laughs> Listen, Comrade Rufo. Why are you trying to change the power structure to what is what does that so mean? So don't so don't deal with the the hypocrisy itself or the person that's being hypocritical, but change the structures of power that allow them to be a hypocrite. Are you sure he hasn't read Hegel? <laughs> because Hegel would be like, Ja, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> I was uh, going to say, yeah, he sound real uh, something. It's Marx's something himself. But yeah, so he, you know, so he's, he wants the same thing, but just in a different way. Yeah. And wants to do it like the same way by influencing <laughs> and remaking the structures of power. But, but, but we're but, the communists. But we're the com- yeah. Right. That's, yeah. that's crazy. And anyway. that is the hypocrisy that you're not supposed to call out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Fifth, and this is like something that I take immense pleasure in, uh, make bad actors pay a price. Um, and I think this is what Andy was saying where he, he actually cited two examples for fighting woke capital. Coca-Cola and Disney. Um, and... Those are, I mean, I think they hit all of the previous four points. Those are telling stories. It's, uh, you know, trying to win the fight. It's, it's making a narrative out of this. And those stories were, were, were put out, you know, 
the Disney one was, was me. Uh, I broke the story on the Disney diversity <laughs> training. I bet he did. Um, and and uh, it was actually really awesome because initially they put out this really pathetic statement saying, oh, this, this writer has distorted our, 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 our diversity training program, which is extremely glorious, and we can't possibly be racist because we made the film Black Panther. Uh, <laughs> And it's like, so Disney, the woke Disney is trotting out the I have black friends defense. Uh, and you realize the absolute pathetic and craven nature of these ideologies, that even the mega $330 billion Disney corporation that literally tells stories for a living is trotting out this absolute trash PR statement um, that shows that they, are, they knew they were on indefensible grounds. And I said very calmly, well... I actually annotated their statement uh, with footnotes saying why it was all kind of bullshit. And, uh, and then within 24 hours, some smart person at Disney just deleted their entire anti-racism program from their internal website. Gone. Uh, and of course, I gleefully you know, tweeted that out. And it's probably going to come back, right? But it shows that you can even leverage these huge corporations uh, by making them pay a price. Uh, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can make them pay a price through PR, through media, through legislation, through policy, through uh, shareholder activism. But figure out where the weak points are and leverage them as, as much as you possibly can. So let me ask you this question. <laughs> do you think that the Disney Corporation is doing like sensitivity training and, and diversity and inclusion training because A, they, they really want to make the world a better place? Like the, the CEOs of these companies, uh -huh. or B, because they're capitalists and people are like, we want this, so they're like, okay, will you buy our stuff if we do this? And, okay, yeah. we'll do it. What do you think, A or B? B. Okay. <laughs> so That's when, why I'm laughing at this whole thing because he's attacking them like it, like almost like I'm gonna hurt their 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 position in life or their main goal, and that ain't why they was doing it to begin with. So he gets them to take their stuff down, uh -huh. right? And yeah. maybe and maybe change their training. I don't know, but he gets them to do something where it makes it. They're talking about less diversity and inclusion. Uh huh. Do you think Disney took those stuff down because of A or B? B. It's B. all. It's all right? about money. It's all capitalism. So he's accusing them of trying to like brainwash <laughs> people. In the meantime, Disney's probably just like, we're just doing what people told us they want us to do. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Do you not want us to do that now? Okay. We won't do it now. <laughs> Whatever. We don't care. We're a, we want monies. Right. Yeah. But in the meantime, this guy succeeded in making this, making this entity less diverse yeah. and less inclusive. Like he actually succeeded in doing that. And to me, that's kind of sad. It's real sad, but it again, it again, it goes to show that Disney wasn't about that life to begin with. Let's say that. And he, if it was that easy for him to write about and whatever, whatever, and instead of them doubling down on it, saying, "Well, this is what we're about because we're this kind of a company," like you said, somebody just went in and wiped the whole thing. I was like, "Ah, we don't need this headache." Mm. And he mentions in there, he says it real quick, but he talks about creating a narrative. Uh -huh. There's more in the clip about that, but I. You know, like trying to keep it brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he talked about creating a narrative, right? So you make the label, and then you create your own story about what it is. And so now he's saying Disney, when they brain, I think it's bad that they brainwash their employees. <laughs> don't you? Don't you think it's bad people brainwash people? But that's not. Yeah, what they're doing, yeah. You know, they're just doing what people told them they wanted them to do. Because they they their end goal is the money. They're trying to make the money. It takes this to make the money. Oh, now we don't want this to make the money. Okay. And now you see why a lot of critical race theorists are against capitalism. Yeah. Because <laughs> you can do this. Yeah. You can force people to do not good things because they don't want to alienate money. your money. When Michael Jordan was critiqued a long time ago about why in his heyday he didn't speak out more against anything, and at that time somebody, it was a political thing about Republicans, Michael Jordan's response was, Republicans buy Air Jordans too. <laughs> In a nutshell, capitalism. So that's a lot. It's its own religion. It's its own thing. Don't call things religions you don't like. <laughs> Anyways. 
And then sixth and finally, I think we have to attack, attack, attack. Um, it's one thing to try to understand these things perfectly intellectually or try to understand them perfectly uh, uh, as, as a policy matter, but sometimes you just have to throw the hand grenade into the enemy camp and see what happens. Uh, and I think we need to be throwing many more hand grenades uh, into the institutions that are promoting this ideology uh, and seeing what happens uh, when they start to scramble and seeing what happens when they're under pressure. Just let's throw in the hand grenades and see what happens. Like he's not, he doesn't give a shit about uh -huh. Marxism or the liberalism let's just, or let, anything. Let's just blow some ish up. <laughs> in conclusion. We have to demonstrate that this is a loser ideology promoted uh. by the most loser, loser departments of these institutions. And we have to turn it culturally toxic. And once we can do that, you're going to see these corporations starting to shift. And we're going to give those executives an easy out. When you say, hey, uh, you know, Coca-Cola, actually telling people to, quote, be less white um, is kind of offensive to a lot of people and probably not a good program to, to hit your wagon to. You're giving that CEO an easy exit. He now has cover to do the thing that he probably wanted to do anyways, but couldn't do it because of the social pressure. So what we just said. <laughs> so maybe it's because they think the diversity training is not good. Maybe they're actually like a racist. Uh -huh, you know? But uh -huh. now, for whichever one of those it is, you got they easy have a quote-unquote easy out. Yep. Which they probably wanted to do anyways, which yep. to me is a little slip right there because you're kind of being like, I mean, they don't like non-white people anyway. Right, so. right, right. When did Coca-Cola tell somebody to be less white? I'm trying to... It's, I don't know, because I don't, it's probably just some thing, they, see, that's why, like, slogans are no good. They probably came up with some, like, fancy slogan, uh huh. and then, like, but now people are able to, I, I don't, I really don't know about it. That's interesting, because I've never heard, uh, or does he literally mean by showing more black and brown faces in their advertising and stuff? I don't know, there. because he just twists stuff around. Of yeah, course he they just didn't says people, it. They didn't go to every employee and just be like, can you please stop acting less white? <laughs> they didn't do that. Yeah. So this one sounds different than the other one. Very much so. Even though he's talking about, like, here's how we can fight it. But this one, he labels it. He puts together just like little press kits for politicians to use who don't understand it. They're just reading from it, whatever he uh -huh. gives. CEOs, for whatever reason, an easy out to not do like some <laughs> of this training, which is like the product of decades of research. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, like, yeah, there's probably nine, 12, there's probably a thousand bad ones, but the million that are good. So sometimes he says one thing here and another thing here, right? And he'll flip the script. And I have one last example well, of him doing that. And it's also, but remember, he made the whole statement about hypocrisy and don't point out the hypocrisy and don't focus on the hypocrisy. Instead, change the the platform and all of that. Well, so we're, we're about to point out the hypocrisy. <laughs> this is an interview on Black News with Mark Lamont Hill. Oh, I feel like I saw this, but go ahead, go ahead. Um, so let me ask you a quick question first. Do you identify as white? Uh, I mean, I'm an Italian American, so you tell me. I, I think, like, you know, my, my father, who's an Italian immigrant, would be very confused. He'd say, What do I have in common with a Swedish person or an English person or a German person? We're totally different. We have different cultures, different languages, different customs. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that lumping people into white, black, Asian, as you suggested, is such a crude and broad categorization. I think we'd be a lot better off trying to drill down into specifics uh, and not trying to pit racial groups yeah. against one another in the political battlefield. Now, this is from <laughs> the clip we just listened where he's at the meeting. Uh huh. So now in like a more private place. But we need to fight from a, a, a position of principled courage. And I, I think what I've learned, and I'll be honest, I'm not immune to this. I'm a white guy fighting critical race theory. Uh, it's like, you know, it got a little bit, there were moments where uh, during this fight, as it was kind of blowing up uh, nationally, it's like, oof, I am about to get blown up. <laughs> it's just a white guy. If right. I but but when you get asked by the black guy, if you identify as white, oh, now I'm Italian American. I'm, I'm this and that as and to not, because putting people, making people identify that way is crude. And what was the second word? 
I don't, I don't know. know. Something like that. But then also he starts studying, which sociologist Eduardo Benia Silva, uh-huh. uh, and he conducted like a, a survey in Detroit where he asked like black and white people like questions about race. Uh-huh. And one thing that would come up is like the white people would always start being like, oh, I, I mean, well, y- you know, I mean, they would sound like, they'd sound like this. Uh, I mean, I'm an Italian-American, so you tell me. I, I think like... You know, my, my father, who's an Italian immigrant, would be very confused. Right? You can I mean, hear Mark Lamar Hill is laughing just like I am. He's like, <laughs> this you can guy. Because he's got to think about it. Yeah. Because he's lying. Yeah, God. yeah, You yeah. don't have to think about it when you're when just, you're, when telling, you're just the truth. telling the truth. That's and absolute. he definitely has an opinion about what race he is. Right, right. Like, he, he only has an opinion about <laughs> what race people are and how that should be treated. Like, you But know? if you ask him, now he's got all these... The hypocrisy, the straight, bold hypocrisy. Don't focus on that. <laughs> but don't, right, right, right. Don't focus on it. As a matter of fact, don't acknowledge it at all. Better yet, change the platform. So now, a twist. And I'll, I'll finish <laughs> with this. Question, is critical race theory being taught in our schools, specifically our K-12? through Nope. Are you sure about that? I am sure. Well, on Christopher Rufo's <laughs> website, he shows you where it is. He uh, critiques a school in Evanston, Illinois, uh-huh. Uh-huh. which is they've they've given reparations. They're about as yeah. as, as as you know inclusive. <laughs> They're about as left as you can go. Uh-huh. Right? Uh huh. Right. He criticized the school system. He got a hold of their curriculum uh-huh. from first grade to like like fifth grade uh-huh. or something. And it's not about critical race theory for once. It's about queer theory. He, he, <laughs> pro- he proves this is queer theory in the school. And he's saying, like, they teach first graders uh, about, like, what flags are. And they talk about, like, the homosexual flag, the LGBT flag. And, uh, and then the third graders, he has them, like, looking at pictures of, like, men in dresses. <laughs> and, and the fifth graders, they... Uh, they learn. They learn how white people are killing the, the 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 spirit lives of Native American people, and what that turns out being is they just like do like every day, and they're like, "Here's the color red. Red <laughs> stands for in this flag. They stand for life. What, what do you like? What About do you think that's special? Red. And and why do you like being alive? And they'll say ponies. Okay. And the next day it's like eh, it's blue and blue. I forget what the blue stands uh-huh, for. Uh-huh. Thing, but they're like the blue. And this means this. What does this mean to you? And they write down, like, blue you know. And so then they're like, and then all these together make up the flag, and this is what the colors mean. So really it's teaching them about colors by the, so it's not so bad. The look right, at right. men in, in pictures is they just have a bunch of, like, cartoon cutouts of people. Uh-huh. And uh, different types of clothes. Uh-huh. And they're like, now put this clothes on this oh, person. Oh, and you can put the dress on the yeah. man. Put the dress you... on the woman. That's fine. Put dress on the man. That's fine. And that's pretty much it. Yeah, and just like showing them that different people wear these clothes by a thing they can like cut out of the paper. Yeah, like. um, and then the Native American thing, like they do mention, like early, he says, like they show them colonizers are are killing the spirit life, and it does kind of have that <laughs> language, but it's not like so bad. Like they're fifth grade. What's fifth grade? Right, right. And they're like twelve years old. Yeah, twelve. Yeah, yeah. That's about right. Eleven, twelve, fifth grade. But then. In the very back of the the curriculum, uh huh, right, and this and this 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 curriculum is only for like a week. Uh huh. It's not the school year. Uh huh. It's for like Pride Week. <laughs> at the very back, at the very back, uh-huh. like the fifth grade or whatever, the last thing, like I think on like the last page, they discuss intersectionality. Uh yeah, I've heard a lot of people coming out against them teaching intersectionality, which is. And they say in the book that I was quoting before, she, Kimberly Crenshaw, who came up with intersectionality, uh-huh. uh, in her groundbreaking paper, Mapping the Margins, where she looked at uh, sexual abuse towards women, uh-huh. found that, like, you know, white dude assaulting a white woman, he gets off sometimes. A black man assaulting a white woman doesn't really get off Doesn't too get much. off at all. <laughs> white man assaulting a black woman gets off more than usual, and a black man assaulting a woman Gets off sometimes. Uh huh. You know what I mean. Uh huh. So like, black men get the worst with white women, but black women get it bad from both. You know, yeah. Injustice from for everybody. Both. So she concludes this is the worst, and it's because they're black and they're a woman. Uh huh. And they're in like maybe perhaps a low economic thing. It's all these things together that converge that you know perhaps make people more prone to 
some of the nastier things in life, right? So they do talk about that. On the last day, on the last page, you know, it's like the very last thing. So intersectionality is there. Uh huh. So that is technically yeah. a legitimate critical race theory term being taught in a K through 12 environment. That one thing. That one thing. And now, and- is that bad to teach? I don't think so because that makes a lot of sense. If you have multiple things that, you know, yeah. one of those things could be being a child. You're more vulnerable. That's why you can't just get in the cars with strangers. Right. Because you Absolutely. Lack awareness, physical strength. You know, you have all these different things. Absolutely. Here's the kicker. He doesn't mention that in his thing he writes. Uh-huh. Because he didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> if he would have read this whole curriculum, oh, he, he would have saw that and been like, that. this is it. The smoking syllabus. I have it in my hands right here. But he didn't read the whole the thing, example. so he but doesn't he even know. But he didn't read the thing, <laughs> which is why we're in this situation in the first place, because nobody reads the books. Well, nobody reads. What you do, you read, Tristan. But then who do I talk to? Because <laughs> nobody else read the books. It's just like, have you read this? You didn't read it. Well, look, that's a perfect note for us to end on telling everybody, read the books. Read the book. <laughs> read the book. <laughs> please, please. Well, listen, I would like to give Tristan Bruins a round of applause. I hope you all have enjoyed this time. Uh, I learned a lot. We talked about a lot. Um, and yeah, we this will we may revisit this again, maybe on his podcast, just so we can have an excuse to get into it all over again. Because again, what what I started out saying early in the podcast to now go through all of this information to just get to a point where you're still dealing with somebody who's not read the book, who's not educated themselves on the very thing that they are have gone to war against, a war with. Um, so that probably tells you he didn't read Sun Tzu either because <laughs> the art of war says you must know thine enemy. Yeah, anyone, if, if, if someone brings up the art of war, that's how you know they haven't read the art of war. <laughs> the person who read it, they would just win. They, yeah, yep, they just do stuff. Uh, but in any event, this has been the Either And Podcast. I'm your host, Brill Barrett. Today's special guest from the... Gasps from a Dying Art Form podcast. Mr. Tristan Bruins. Give it up, y'all. I should have. I don't even feel like pushing the applause button on the thing. We're just going to end this podcast. Thank you very much. And remember, y'all, if you take nothing else from this, read the book. Peace.